All right. Today is August 24th, and this is a CES meeting. Um, today on the agenda, we have a few topics. We're going to try to get through um, at least one. <laughs> uh, today, uh, we've set aside for Alex to discuss mass revocation of proxies, um, as he's uh, volunteered to champion that proposal as an invited expert with the support of Jack and Mark. Um, and hopefully we can get some paperwork through so that uh, Alex can present at a, at a nearby plenary. Um, so uh, after that, we have a couple of topics. Jack has brought up an issue with module virtualization, specifically that there is a particular form that we can't uh, of JavaScript that it is not currently capable of virtualizing. And Carity has some uh, some conversations and clarifications he'd like to make regarding um, the spec text for layer zero um, around the, the shape of the module constructor that we're converging upon. Um, so with that, please, Alex, take it away. OK, um, just to emphasize, um, I do believe that actually Jack and Mark are the champions, and I'm just the author slash invited expert trying to deliver this idea. So let me jump to my Firefox window here. Yes, this one. OK. So basically, proxies currently take two arguments. Um, there's a shadow target for tracking the various properties and the frozen state slash sealed state, I'm sorry, extensible state of a proxy and the proxy handler, which implements the traps. And if you have hundreds of proxies, this becomes a bit of a problem. You have so many proxies when you're trying to revoke them, it's either hundreds of revoker functions or no revocation at all. And that's a scalability problem. It's a, it's a bookkeeping problem membranes. So when it comes to membranes, and apologies, gentlemen, this is reiterating some of the things that we have seen but have not been presented to TC39 in probably quite some time. Um, the first model of membranes that Mark and Dr. Tom Van Cutsum came up with was of a cell membrane, hence where the name membrane came from. You're either inside the membrane or outside it. And it's just, you can have proxies on the outside pointing to values inside, or you can pass in objects through the membrane to have proxies on the inside of the membrane. So you had basically two sides. Objects are proxies, excuse me, objects are circles, proxies are semicircles. Well, when I got to thinking about this, and I, I was presenting actually in July 2018 at the TC39 plenary in Redmond, Washington, I, there was a, co a question that came up saying, hey, is biology required to understand this? And on the fly, I responded, no, you really don't need that, but we're going to get to a three-dimensional way. It's more three, it's a three-dimensional model that we're, we're going to get, we're going to get to. Um, at the time, even I didn't understand fully what I was saying. Two months later, I came up with a geometric model to illustrate this better, where instead of either inside a cell membrane or outside, now I'm using object graphs as two dimensions, as a, as a two-dimensional plane, and the, the um, connection, and they're parallel to each other. The planes are parallel to each other. So right now we have spheres for the objects, proxies are semi are hemispheres, and we have cylinders to illustrate the connections between them. Um, it's worth mentioning that now we can add in additional planes for additional object graphs, and that physical distance doesn't mean anything between each object graph and each each uh, proxy, except that you don't want intersections. So you can swap the planes. You can add more planes as you see fit. They are not ordered. No um, object graph has precedence over any other. Um, and we've created basically what I call a hypergraph membrane out of all this. 
So why are we here for this conversation? Well, um, in April, 2021, Mark pitched this idea where, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, let me back up. When it comes to shutting down one object graph, you wanna shut down both the proxies in that object graph and proxies <coughs> to objects in that object graph that where the proxies live in other object graphs. Mark came up with this idea of revoking, having a revoke method on a shadow realm, which would handle the first of those revocations, proxies in the same shadow realm, but it wouldn't necessarily cover proxies in other shadow realms, which is what this slide was about. So the idea I had was, what if we had a revocation controller or revocation um, mechanism where we could pass that in as a third argument to new proxy and to proxy that revocable? Um, and to make sure that the API was as extensible as possible, we would pass it in as a property of an options dictionary. And the options dictionary would be that third argument. Then we could share that signal among many proxies and we could have all these proxies have an internal slot pointing to that signal. If the signal itself is revoked, you clear the slots and throw. When, when invoking the proxy, when invoking the handler trap. Um, when garbage collection comes along and sees a proxy with a dead signal, a revoked signal, it can treat it as a dead proxy and clear the slots right away. Um, one of the things that Chris brought up, I believe, was that this would mean proxy that revocable could be considered a mistake. Um, I don't think it was. I think it was a good idea. I think it still is a good idea and that um, we want to keep it around. But one of the advantages of this proposal here is that you have less re proxy revoke revocation, excuse me, far fewer proxy revokers that need to be created in the first place. Um, less memory allocation. You don't have much garbage collection pressure, as Bradley pointed out when, when I first presented this idea to this group. As a result, instead of hundreds or thousands of revoker functions that have to be A, created, B, held in a weak map, and C, held weekly, I should say, no, held weekly related to the shadow target, and C, invoked when you are trying to clean up, you have at most one for each element of the power set of object graphs, which means if you have three object graphs, you have at most eight revoker functions. I actually technically seven. If you have four object graphs, you have at most 16, technically 15 revoker functions. And in most cases, you'll have n times n minus one revoker functions at most, because those are gonna be your, I'm sorry, n times n minus one divided by two for the number of object graphs you have because you really, most of the time, your proxies are only depending on two object graphs, the graph that the proxy lives in and the graph that the original object lives in. So in cross-cutting concerns, um, there have been questions raised about, cancel, about the cancellation proposal, which is currently stage one, I believe. Um, I have no objection whatsoever. I think it's actually worth exploring whether the cancellation API that's been proposed is what the shape of the revocation signal could be. I think that's, if we can get that proposal to, to move along and get it in, I think that's perfectly fine. I don't remember off the top of my head if cancellation is synchronous or asynchronous, but I do think that we can work around that in one way or another in the JavaScript code base. Um, as I'm sorry, JavaScript client code, I should say. Regarding the shadow realm dot prototype, the revoke idea that spawned all this, I think that we still want to keep that around and that the two proposals actually complement each other. You could have a revocation for the shadow realm 
and then the tied set of revocation functions for these um, proxies, the signals, I should say. And it's still a very, very small set. You're probably talking less than a dozen total compared to, as I said, hundreds or thousands for a membrane situation. And that's the end of the slides, gentlemen. Um, if you want, we can take, I, I'll, I can take a few moments for questions or we can look at the uh, current proposal spec. Uh, I, I want to um, bring up what's an odd idea. Um, in the uh, weak refs and finalization um, uh, system, we did something odd with regard to uh, revocation. And uh, Agoric, uh, since then, had a need to revoke something with regard to, with regard to a timer API. And we adopted the same mechanism, and it was surprisingly good. Right? Um, so the idea is that rather than having a revoca revocation token be a thing with behavior, it's just an arbitrary object that you provide as an additional optional argument. Um, and then there's also a separate revoke API where you can uh, revoke and provide the same identity that you'd provided earlier. And then it revokes everything for which that identity had been provided as an argument. The thing that's surprising about it is just that uh, you know, by reusing the same identity, you can uh, revoke uh, many things by just revoke by just revoke and and using that token, uh, and um, uh, that's it. That way we get that way we can avoid the entire issue about cancellation APIs and the the. Um, uh, the difficulty of getting that to move forward, much as I'd like to see it move forward. Uh, and we are uh, sitting on the existing precedent that has succeeded getting through uh, TC39 um, in the context of uh, weak references, and it turns out to be a good API. Yeah. Um... The one pushback I'll give you on that, Mark, is that I, is based on my own experience with weak ref and finalization ref registry, um, particularly the fact that when you call the finalize when when the uh, how do I put this? I'm worried about the uh, lack of synchronicity. It's okay if you have a synchronous function that causes the finalization and also does marks a flag synchronously so that it can be picked up by a component of the proxy handler to handle that when someone else accesses that proxy handler through another proxy. Um, and that's kind of where I was gonna go with my shim word. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand that at all. Um, um, I'm, I'm it, thinking, it, it, I, I, don't, I don't see, I mean, there's nothing asynchronous in the, pro the proxies don't know anything about asynchrony. Yes, that's, the, the, I know that. The, the semantics I have in mind would be a completely synchronous immediate revocation. Yes, which I don't believe the finalization registry supports. Yeah, but I think that's that's irrelevant, right? I, mean, I think that's the, the, the use of a, of a token in the way that weak references use it is perfectly able to support synchronous revocation. The Ron Buckton's proposal does uh, is explicitly synchronous for what it's worth, Alex. I see Carity's hand. Yeah, um, so the, the, the comments that I have are not related to this part of the conversation. So the can you go to the last slide that you show? This one here? Yeah, this one. So a couple of notes on this. So when it comes to the shadow realm, 
it would be tricky to do any of these because when we create a wrap function, we don't really keep track of where, where, where that actual function belongs to. So it's only the, the receiver of the function, the one that gets the wrap version of it. We don't, we, we, we do have a pointer back to, back pointer back to the actual function or wherever that function lives, but we don't keep track of what realms has that function in the first place. So how to add more things to the equation in order to get any sort of um, pointer back to a thing that eventually will be revoked. So you can revoke this, this uh, function that you have. The term revoke in that case, it, it might be a little bit tricky because a, a wrap function is not a proxy. So it might, might not be the same thing. So what happened when you call that? What happened when you try to interact with that function? I, I don't know. Um, so in that case, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure about what 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 would be the the mechanism that we we'll use to be able to say this particular shadow realm. Let's shoot it down, and now uh, all the things that were leaked out of this shadow realm as functions, like wrap functions or callable, uh, make them useless um, at this point. Any interaction with them it will be useless. Um, the revoke case there is tricky because not only what I explained, but also the function is still useful. You can add things to it. You can do all kinds of things that will not trigger any any of the things that you will trigger if it was a proxy that was revoked. Because the proxy revoke has a lot more nuances around it that uh, when you interact with that object or function, you 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 do get certain things that will just fail. In the case of the wrap function, you don't have those constraints, so it doesn't fail. It only fails if you actually call it. That's the kind of thing that we might we might we we might have a hard time um figure it out so the fact that the the wrap function doesn't know where the target function is coming from makes it a little bit more difficult so that's one 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 note on that um on the the callable boundary being able to share the cancellation itself is also problematic because i suspect and you go up maybe one slide um, one more, where well, you have the example uh, the, here. So for what I can see here, the sign of is actually callable. So you can call it to kill the proxy. Um, to answer your first point, um, Carity, I think that I would want to defer to Mark because again, the Shadow Realm revocation proposal was his idea and he can explain that in more detail. I'd like to punt that to a, a later discussion, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, 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 that's fine. I, I, my, my recommendation is not included in the in the presentation because that might just create more noise. Um, I agree with I, I agree with Curdy's um, recommendation. I do think that um, that there are good engineering answers to the questions that Curdy is raising, but I think that uh, for what Alex is doing. Uh, it's best not to, you know, just to mention that historically and not to uh, raise the idea that we want to push that actively. Uh, Alex, okay. in general, just being, being, you know, more minimalist um, that, um, you know, trying to, to, to figure out what's sort of the minimal um, proposal that, that, that satisfies the goals you're setting out to. And in particular, even if there are good engineering solutions to the shadow realm revocation, which I believe there there are, um, once I've got good revocable membranes, I don't care because I'm never going to use a shadow realm without a membrane anyway, um, and I can just use good membrane revocation to accomplish whatever I could have accomplished with shadow realm revocation. Okay. Um, I got, I threw that in last night anyway, and if, if you guys think it's not worth having, I, I am perfectly fine dropping it. Um, yeah. Let me ask. Okay. Okay. 
can you go back to the, the sign off? Because I think there are a couple of, uh, it's a cross cutting with to what Marx was saying before about making the sign on more like a hand waving thing, like an object that you pass around. Um, so the two issues that I have with this, so first of all, sign on, on, the, on, on itself is not a thing that you can share. Um, so let me see, what, how can I say this? So if you share that sign on with the shadow realm, uh, no. across the callable boundary, on the other side, you will not be able to revoke that sign up. You can only, I mean, you, you would not be able to use that sign up for things on the other side. So that's an important distinction, I believe. So basically, oh, I, I see what you're getting at. You create a sign up here, that sign up is not useful beyond the current realm that you are on. Okay. Uh, okay. So you will not be able to do the second line new proxy, yada, yada, with the sign up that you receive across the, the membrane. So that's, that's just a nonsense. But yeah. um, we need we need to clarify that or at least have it somewhere. So it's basically it's per realm. So you, you can only use it in, in that realm itself. Okay. Uh, um, uh, so the second thing is that the, the sign on itself, which is callable here, um, you will be able to share it with another realm and call it at the other realm and it will trigger the kill of the proxy. So that works fine. So I'm giving that thing to you. You you don't know what it is, but if you call it, it kills my proxies. Fine. Not that you will have to do that, but it will work that way because the wrapping will just call the underlying sign off and that kills the proxy. Um, the making that thing an arbitrary object, um, I don't know if it's more useful or not. You still will be able to maybe use like, imagine that you use like a symbol because it could be anything that so you could use a symbol and then you can share that symbol between different realms and use these things to create, to create new proxies on the other side with the same symbol. And now suddenly you can revoke that symbol in one side and what are the implications of doing so? Is it going to kill uh, every, every proxy that was created with that symbol across the board, even if it is across the realms, I believe it's doable because it's the same memory space, but um, it, it might, it might. What, what I'm trying to say is that Mark's idea of using an arbitrary object might actually work better than a callable for these cases of across realm um, um, membranes. And when I say across realm membrane is, I don't know what that means. It, it might be that you're building a membrane that contains multiple realms and it's not a membrane between two realms, but a membrane between a subset of realms, something like that. Yeah. Um, let me take a moment to unpack what you said here, Carity, because we you kind of ran two or maybe three ideas together there in that um, answer. Um, regarding whether signal is a callable function, or a symbol or whatnot. Um, I personally do not care that much. I am simply throwing this idea out there to see what sticks. And I think that that's something that we can determine as we evolve this proposal. So I am perfectly open to, to all that. And I do believe, Carity, you raised these points in January when we discussed this proposal I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> January's conversation, I don't remember. But um, I, I reviewed the video last night um, in preparation for this conversation. So um, we may need to go back and, re and revisit that. Uh, regarding... I, I do I do recall that in January I was more opposed. Now, not that much of opposed to this. It seems like a good idea, but um, we need to clear these little things. Right. Um, regarding options being a dictionary object containing properties, I did that deliberately because I was worried about if we made the revocation signal a top level argument, then we might risk getting the API wrong more than anything and worried about breaking things in forward compatibility. And a forward yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree with that. A, a, a good. So the way I'm looking at this is basically 
can I have an option that uh, sign out to the proxy that the handler should be read once during creation time rather than keep it then live, something like that. So to make it faster, things like that, we might be able to add it later on in the option box. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and then yeah. your last point, Carity, or actually your first point was about um, the relationship between the membrane and the realms. And this has been a point that we've had a little bit of cross chatter on where in one in my scenario, the realms are child realms of the uh, realm that the membrane is running in. And in the scenario you're posing, the membrane is inside one of those realms and the other realms are siblings. That is an important distinction. It's worth thinking about, but I think that really depends on the design of the membrane itself and not on the uh, proposal here. I think that both ideas should inform this proposal conceptually. Um, and I cannot give you a better answer than that at this point. You were going to go on back to slide eight, uh, I believe, to ask a question about uh, uh, this this point. Uh, uh, I I concur that this could be a um, this could this this particular. It does not need to be mentioned that um, that this might make the uh, the existence of proxy revocable um, duplicative with a new API. That's that's not a concern. It's um, a quip more than anything else. Um, and certainly it would do nothing to give energy to this proposal. So yeah, I figure you should take it out. Yeah. Take also, just, also, I disagree with it. I think that in light of this proposal, proxy revocable was a mistake. Was or was not? Was. Okay. I mean, um, so you got the thing, drop this slide. Yeah, it's kind of here nor there. It's it, yeah, sure, it may have been a mistake, but that doesn't affect whether this is a good fix. Um, and, and, and it doesn't affect whether we can remove proxy revocable. It's 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 not possible. Yeah, that 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 ship has sailed, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to remove that. Yeah. So there, yeah, there's there's no reason to mention it. Um, is in terms of. Uh, additional for additional feedback for uh, bringing this to plenary. I think that um, it, with the time you save from um, omitting those slides, I think that it would be great to lead this presentation with a recap of not just what is a membrane or why we need a more sophisticated model for membranes or why we need uh, we need. Um, uh, it would be good to talk about uh, why would you use this? What's the motivating use case? And um, so why why have revocation at all? And then um, how do membranes exacerbate the problem? Um, uh, and how does having mass revocation address the problem created by large amounts of membranes or large cardinality membranes? I have thought about that. Um... And I have not rejected that, um, Chris. I'm thinking about this in terms of, and that's what these uh, first five, these five slides here were about, was trying to reintroduce membranes. And you're saying I haven't gone deep enough into that. Okay, I'll, well, I'll, I'll take that point. Yeah. Um, I guess- To be, to, to, to be uh, explicit, I think that the reason why you need a membrane is so that you can, you is, is, is very, I, I agree that there's thing there are things to worry about is that that's part of the object capability model that 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 motivates the need for this uh, the ability to revoke uh, an authority that's imbued by a capability and it, the capability is transitively received from it um which might not be a popular stance but it is uh, an honest one about the motivation I guess. What I'm coming from is trying to see how much of this is material that the current 
delegates and members of TC39 are familiar with, because again, the speech that Mark and I gave was four years ago, and there's been quite a lot of evolution since. So it may be good to add more slides before slide three here, uh, borrowing from my more general presentation that's better written in my opinion. <laughs> um, I, I'm, yes, so yeah, so, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that thing about how long ago it was. Because one of the things that's um, inter interesting to keep in mind is just there is a significant turnover in the committee. A large fraction of the people that will be in the room were simply not on the committee four years ago. Okay. All right. Well, that, that, that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Um, here's what I'll do. I'll edit this to add in a lot of those introductory slides, Mark, but I'm worried about taking this from a... 30-minute talk to a 60-minute talk, if you know what I mean. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You're much better off with the 30, trying for a 30-minute time slot altogether, including QA. I, I definitely think you should go for that. Um, uh, even though they hadn't seen your previous membrane talk, I think you can assume that everybody on the committee knows what a membrane is. So I, th I, th I don't think this talk is, is, is miscalibrated in terms of that, um, I don't think a lot needs to change uh, because of the, the committee turnover. I just wanted you to keep in mind. Yeah, I'm, I'm not recommending a, a large section. I'm recommending a single slide just to introduce the motivation because that will be a question you get. So why do we need membranes? <laughs> why do we have this problem in the first place? Oh, you're suggesting why do we need membranes? Mm -hmm. um, Okay, that was not occurring. That did not occurred to me as something that needed to be explained at this point. Um, let me take that thought offline. I hear what you're saying. I just don't know how to answer right now, off the off the cuff. What you what you guys are saying, and it sounds like Chris and Mark are actually, to my ear, they're actually disagreeing a bit on this. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think, I mean, at, at this point, membranes are just one of the programming patterns people use in JavaScript. It's entrenched, it's established. And, um, and the idea of it being a boundary for uh, imposing some kind of policy about what crosses the boundary, I think is, I think that's, maybe I'm, this, maybe I'm, overestimating the degree to which people already understand that and accept I it. I think you are, Mark. Uh, I think, I, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't, I was not knowledgeable with the concept of membranes until sometime 2020, I think, uh, when I started reading about more about proxies and their use cases. Hmm. Well, okay. Uh, in that case, I, I retract my objection. Chris is right. Yeah, I will probably add, um, <clears throat> I, I will probably add a few slides. I hope to keep it down to two between slides two and three, but that's a big assumption at this point, guys. Um, mm -hmm. Because, and, and the counterpoint is if I have to explain membranes every single time that I present this idea, that's gonna be annoying to everybody in the room, not just me. Um, so what, one, one recommendation that might work here, um, is to find other use cases that use a membrane but are more uh, close to what people are doing these days in frameworks and libraries. For example, um, you look at libraries like uh, Vue, uh, they use the reactive proxies. Uh, you look at libraries like um, a few, few of them that I can send you a link uh, that are please using. Do. Please, please, please do. So the more, the more references I have, the better. Yeah, I don't know if for them this will be useful, but they definitely use a membrane approach. Um, we use it one on Salesforce. Um, it's called uh, uh, observable membrane, uh, which is yes, just I remember that. You, you, you get an object, you put some values in that object, you use that object as the current state of the DOM. And then when someone makes mutations on that object, which is your proxy, the UI gets refreshed and it, it keeps refreshing itself. Um, 
for for those cases, we use sort of an state machinery there where we say, okay, this proxy is useful until it's not useful anymore. And what we what we, we drop all together from the weak map and we remove the thing from the scheduler, basically that updates the UI. But nevertheless, this is a case where you have multiple proxies that has to work in 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 a in a in a um, coordinated manner, and you want to drop all these proxies at once, make them use use useless at one, uh, in one go. And so, any example like that might be easier for people to understand what's going on, rather than going into the details of what a membrane is. I think um, this would be a good time to segue to our next topic, Alex. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I think, I think that's fine. I don't want to drag everybody through the text when we have 12 minutes left. I think now is a good time for me to stop. Well, thank you, Alex. I think it's a good presentation and look forward to seeing it at Plenary. Yep. Um, I will probably want to run this by this group again in about a month and then possibly also before Friday a.m. and take the roasting at that event. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Jack, you still with us? Hello, I'm still here. Yeah, Jack, um, you brought up a topic about um, uh, virtual module sources not being sufficiently advanced to virtualize JavaScript itself. Yes. Do you, uh, do you have something to show or talk through? Um, no, just in the issue. So I think we should make some change in the virtual module format so uh, because um, I am actually using it uh, in our production so it's somehow will be a problem so uh, as you can see in the issue uh, if we have a code yes module that writes exports a function declaration and it will not be expressible in the current virtual module format, um, because if you have two modules that reference, uh, that imports each other, and they both export a function, uh, you will ha somehow have some uh, TDZ error because um, current formats only have uh, one shot to integralize the module, but the virtual module, uh, but in the ES module semantics, it need two uh, two pass. The first pass, it need to integralize all the um, top level bindings, like those function declarations, and the second pass is to execute the code. So if we don't have two passes in the virtual module format, we cannot uh, translate ES modules into this format. So let's talk a little bit about um, about scope. Uh, so with the original compartments proposal, when uh, when Mark pitched virtualizable modules to me, um, Part of the it was it was a well known caveat and limitation that it wouldn't be suitable for emulating JavaScript, um, and that was in a in a prior form that was much much farther from being able to emulate JavaScript. Um, Mark, in what part, did you in particular the thing that I that I did not want to pay a complexity cost in order to emulate uh, was live bindings. Um, the you know live uh, JavaScript is the only um, thing that needs live bindings. Um, you know, WASM does not, JSON obviously does not. Um, and I think that, um, you know, any language that, that might seem to, to need live bindings, you can do the kind of the WASM, the tricks that WASM does to emulate them by other means. So, so yeah, the, and the, the, um, what it would take to, do a virtual module API that did support live bindings. I just thought it just, 
it wasn't worth the complexity cost for what's a missed feature anyway. And at that time, the virtual module um, API was substantially less ready. Uh, it was, but, uh, so what has changed is that Modable uh, implemented, uh, 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 Modable proposed an adjustment to um, the compartments API where uh, in, instead of having, um, well, in any case to this, where there's a first argument to initialization that is an object representing the, um, the essentially the shallow properties of the module um, environment record, the, 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 the values that are bound both exported in and imported, um, such that you could just do, um, uh, you, you could address the properties of that in anywhere uh, in JavaScript where uh, and a, a bound name was mentioned. And that puts us much closer to being able to emulate JavaScript. And it seems like this is just one more, that, that we're just one more step away from being able to do it. But it does come with a complexity cost that we might or might not want to pay. Um, so, but first off, Jack, totally recognize that this is a useful API um, for our purposes. Um, the SESGEM does this in a different way, um, but it, yeah, it, with it, the, the um, SESGEM separates the the layers of what what's done for emulating JavaScript from what gets you know, what's used for virtualizing other languages. Um, perhaps that's an answer here. Maybe we could have two separate module source protocols. Um, I want to share our use case. So um, I am working on a plugin system that is fully virtualized. And so, and, and we cannot use eval in our environments. So uh, SysShim cannot be used. And my uh, answer to this is I made a compiler to compile all ES modules into the virtual module format. So uh, it's important to me that this format should be able to emulate, uh, fully emulate the ES module. And yes, I also have some um, concern about the two-stage internalization because it's different from the ES module one that uh, ES modules to the, uh, the internalized environment function of a source text module record only bind the um, declared variable names and functions, but if we bring that into the virtual module format, it allows to run any arbitrary code when the module graph is doing the individualized environment, which my, uh, which looks be not good, but uh, in another way, I think we should uh, have some way to uh, fix this problem. So what? So so Jeff, what is the differential complexity? What is the additional complexity? Uh, that we'd um, have to accept in order to um, to get this. Uh, I don't know. That depends on how we change the API shape to do that. For example, yeah. guys, can someone yeah. like in a, in a minute explain what the problem is? Because still, I'm still lost on this. Uh, okay. Um, uh, let me. Oh, I, I'm using Zoom on my phone, so let me uh, write a code in the in the Google Docs. The uh, if someone who it doesn't matter. Anyone who understands the, the the problem can explain the details of this because I I don't I don't follow what this is. Yeah. Um. Okay. So let's take a step back. Uh. The the problem. 
Yeah, I'm not sure where to start for you, Carity, but the one of one of the problems is uh, in the absence of first class module and module source constructors, it's necessary to have this API for third party or first party modules. Um, and so there are a couple of ways of doing it. Um, one of Oh, okay. So it's it's not it's not about. So I got confused on the third comment in the thread there, where we talk about a module block. And so that module block will work just fine. It export a function A, which is going to be hoist, so it can be called right away. Right. So the question. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, I see. You're asking the bigger question. Uh, the the um, actually a much narrower question. Um, yeah, the, the, the problem is that if you have two functions, as, as Jack said, if you have two modules that um, are using function hoisting, uh, by current ESM semantics, regardless of which of those modules is the entry point in a cycle, um, both of them should be immediately available, able to access uh, a reference to, the sh uh, to each other's functions because they got hoisted to, a t to initialization time, which preceded execution time for both of the modules. Mm -hmm. Do we um, even emulate that in our shim? Uh, I don't recall. We might not. I believe we did not. Okay, so it seems that the problem is with an API that I'm not familiar with, to, to at least yet, to create these virtual modules, modules that will, will have some stuff in there, created not from source, but created manually uh, somehow. And in, in that case, there might be some issues with uh, modules depending on that virtual module. Is that it? Uh, yeah, linking virtual modules is, does not faithfully emulate the first class module. Okay, okay. I'll, 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 another I'll, way of looking at it, another way of looking at it is that um, there is potentially, one way of looking at virtual modules is that uh, is that there is possibly a way to uh, to look at them as desugared modules, right? The, the the idea is that there's a mapping from a syntactic module to a virtual module. That and the question is, does that need to be fully faithful to JavaScript? So, to the extent if if, if you're linking WebAssembly or JSON or an HTML web component or something like that. This issue is not is it is not necessary for virtual modules to be a uh, to support a full desugaring of JavaScript JavaScript modules. But for Jack's use case, it is necessary. Yes. Now, let, me, let me mention that the this pre this um, uh, early export of function is actually a, a distinct complexity than from the uh, live bindings. They're both kind of in the same area, but um, uh, but I hadn't even, you know, when I decided to reject live bindings um, to avoid the complexity, I wasn't even really thinking about this early export of function of hoisted functions. Um, that's also just a very, very odd and very JavaScript specific semantics. Uh, so Jack, is, is your, do you have a suggested, um, you know, minimal addition to the virtual module uh, API? Yeah, that addresses, so, so to, that addresses to, both both the early export and the live bindings. Um, I'm not sure if it is minimal, but the form I suggested in the Top top thread is possible to support live binding and functional hoisting. It is uh, uh, it is also like how System JS supports for ESM module semantics. But so it's but it brings a lot. I, I believe it brings a lot complexity in the integralized environment stage. Because yeah, it's so, a long arbitrary code. Can, can we wait until we get to that API? Because we haven't really seen, I haven't seen the, the relationship or the 
intersection semantic between these and the work that we're doing for module source and module yeah. instances and uh, reflection and all yada yada. So it seems too early for me to comprehend what the problem is. We um it seems that your suggestion is is mandatory actually since we're over time by a few minutes uh, and this is obviously a topic that we're going to revisit. Um, thank you for bringing this, Jack. Um, yeah. Well, let me just say I'm I'm very open to paying a small complexity cost to solve a larger problem. I just want to to get a, have a good sense of what the cost is. Yeah, in this case, the 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 cost is. Um, deferring execution by returning a closure. And that's the difference. So essentially taking the virtual module um, sort, uh, protocol that we have and then adding a new phase to it um, by uh, partial application, essentially. Okay, I'll have to, that, that sounds very plausible. I, I don't understand what it means concretely yet, but, but we'll, let's do that next time. Yeah, all right. Thank you, everybody. I'll stop the recording.